we're back in Acts chapter 5 and 17, we left off, and, and today we're talking about the church and the church being a movement for God. And the church now is gaining great traction in the book of Acts. It's, it's gone from a group of 120 hiding up in an upper room to an army that on the day of Pentecost, on the very first day of the Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved in one day. Church of 120 went to 3,120 people. And then the lame man was here. Remember we saw that story a couple weeks ago. Peter and John are walking to the temple and they're going by the beautiful gate or in the beautiful gate and they see this lame man that had been lame since he was born, 40 years old, begging alms. And Peter said to him, hey, silver and gold have we none. But what I do have, Jesus, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. What do you say? Rise up and walk. And what did the guy do? He didn't just walk. He leapt up. And he started praising God and worshiping God. And all throughout Jerusalem, the news that the church had brought the healing of Jesus Christ to this man. And now he was leaping and praising God. And he was in the temple walking and praising God. Awesome. And then Peter preached again. Peter preached a great sermon after that. And then the church grew to 5,000 5, men which with women and children, probably 15,000 people now in the church. We're talking about major movement. And then we also see that they were a church that not only growing numerically, they were growing spiritually. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. And God was doing signs and wonders. Incredible things were happening. Not only healings, but demon-possessed people. Boom, demons gone. Darkness turned into light. Wonderful stuff. And the fire is spreading. We're going to see it spread throughout the whole chapter we're looking at today of this movement, this church getting traction, and this church making a difference for the kingdom of God. And a church on fire is what it was. My prayer for us as a church, next, this next year, may we get on fire. Because you know what? Fire spreads. Just ask the people up in North Carolina or Tennessee mountains. Fire spreads, right? Fire not only catches, but it spreads. And that's what we're supposed to be doing for the kingdom of God. We're not supposed to be keeping the self to ourselves. We're not supposed to be keeping all that the Lord's blessed with just our little holy auto. We're supposed to be a movement. We're supposed to get traction. We're supposed to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And one of my favorite things when I was a kid was we go to my Aunt Ada's in Minnesota. You know, Minnesota. And we go up to her farm. And Aunt Ada, every year, she had these cornfields and everything else, and she wanted to get down to the dirt again. And I don't know if you've ever been to Minnesota or Wisconsin, Iowa. Dirt is a whole other, oh, it's, it's black up there. I mean, it's, it's ooh, fertile stuff. And, but she wanted to get it all burned down. And I enjoyed that, but I think there's a partial pyromaniac in me a little bit. But we, we even cheated a little bit. We put some gas on those, you know, all the dead stuff, and we lit on fire. I remember watching just one part of the field. We'd light on fire, and it <laughs> blow through the whole field. And just blazing fire through the whole field to get it all back down to the ground. And I was thinking about that. That's what the church is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be on fire. That we just blaze through our communities, in our cities, in our areas with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we make a difference, and we spread the fire of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to learn how to do that this morning. I'll give you four principles this morning on how to be a movement from the example of the New Testament church. Are you church ready to study it? Amen? Amen? All right, Acts chapter 5. Let's look. Jump back into 5. Verse 17 is where we left off. And the religious leaders are getting nervous. And they're getting nervous because the church is becoming a movement. Thousands of Jewish people are coming to Christ. And these religious leaders are nervous about losing their religious control over people that are now being converted. Their Jewish brethren were converted to Christ. And so you remember last week, they imprisoned Peter and John, and they said, no longer teach about this Jesus. No longer speak in his name. And Peter said, uh, well, we're supposed to, whether we're supposed to obey you rather than God, you be the judge. But we can't stop speaking about the name of Jesus Christ. No way. And now they're arresting Peter and John and all the apostles. They're putting them in jail overnight, and then they're going to inquisition them the next day. So with that background in mind, let's jump in. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. But the high priest rose up along with his associates, 
and that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. And they laid their hands on the apostles, and they put them in, jail, in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, go, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak, and they began to what? They're going to teach. They're going to teach. And now when the high priests and the associates came, they call, called the council together. The council is the Sanhedrin. That's the 70 ruling elders of, of Israel. They're all together. And they're coming up with a game plan to in, inquisition these apostles. And even all the senate of the sons of Israel, they sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But look at this. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison and they returned and reported back. And they were saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now that's interesting to me. Angel came, unlocked the prison doors, let them out, told them to go preach, preach in the temple. But what did the angel do afterwards? He went back and he tidied up and he locked the door. And so when these guards came, they had to unlock the door and they went in and they go, where'd these guys go? Interesting. And then it says in verse 24, now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what could have come of this. But someone came and reported to them saying, the men whom you put in prison are what? This is great. They're standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. And then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I believe God has a good sense of humor. And I believe that right now, God is in heaven just going, <laughs> well, laughing at these rulers trying to stop his church. He's probably saying, didn't my son Jesus say, I will build my church? and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Psalm 2, it says this, verse 2, it says, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed. And then Psalm 2, 4 says, And he who sits in the heaven, what? Laughs. And the Lord scoffs at them. And I think at this point, with these religious leaders trying to stop the church and stop the movement of Jesus Christ, God in heaven is just saying, <laughs> He's having a good chuckle. And not only that, there's Sadducees. Sadducees were the religious leaders that didn't believe in angels, didn't believe in the afterlife, didn't believe in uh, supernatural things. And so God sends an angel for those Sadducees. and says, I'll show you. But interesting, I want you to see, first thing that's important here, they were a movement because they were a movement based upon the teaching of God's word. Four times teaching is mentioned in the scripture I just read. Go back. Go back to what we just read. Look at, look, at, look at verse 21. It says this. Upon hearing this, they entered the temple about day, daybreak, and they began to what? Teach. It's a movement based on teaching. Verse 25. It says, but someone came and reported them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple, and they're what? Teaching the people. Verse 28. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, yet you filled Jerusalem Fill Jerusalem with your what? Teaching. They were a movement because they had the teaching of God's word to the point that they were filling their whole city with the teachings of Jesus Christ. You know what? That's what we're supposed to be doing as a church. We're supposed to be inundating our cities, our Jerusalems, with the teaching of Jesus Christ. You know, I was out in Southern California for 10 years pastoring and going to seminary out there. And my first pastorate, I wasn't a Calvary Chapel guy, but there was a radio station called K-Wave. It was the Calvary Chapel's radio station. It was called K-Wave, the wave of living water. And they had teaching 24-7. Every time we turned that radio station on, someone was teaching, and they were teaching with unction, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and they were teaching the Word of God. And I fell right into Calvary Chapel because I, I got under that teaching. And you know what? That radio station went from Los Angeles all the way down to San Diego. And if you think about it, how many people, when it was full powered, how many people were affected by the teaching of Jesus Christ? And that's one reason why in Southern California, Calvary Chapel is a movement. 
Southern California, I, there's, there's 250 Calvary chapels just in Southern California. They're on every corner, it seems like. Everywhere you turn, there's Calvary chapels. It's, and it, it's, they fill that whole area with a teaching. And they're not small little churches. Most of the Calvary chapels in Southern California, a lot of them are thousands of people per church. And they've gotten movement out there because of the emphasis of God's word and teaching God's word. You know, I, I one time was talking to Pastor Chuck, founder of Calvary Chapel, after one of our sessions in a senior pastor's conference. I asked him about what, what's brought about this great movement. I mean, you were a church of 25 people in 1965, and now there's 1,200 Calvary Chapels across the whole country in the United States. How'd that happen? And he said, well, part of it was worship. He said, we had this Maranatha music thing, and God just, by the power of the Holy Spirit, brought upon this worship that was just anointed. He said, a part of it was love. He said, we learned to love hippies and young people, and they knew if they came to our church, they'd be loved. But he also said, I think the primary reason why we've seen such incredible movement and growth is God's word. We just focused on learning God's word together and teaching God's word. And he said, and healthy sheep reproduce more sheep. And as we've fed the sheep, they've grown and gotten strong. I want to tell other people. And he said, and the thing that's made us a movement, he said, and brought this growth was the teaching of God's word. And so what are we going to do as a church? Church, we're going to just be in God's word. How do we grow in respect to our salvation? By longing for the pure milk of God's word. Just keep learning God's word, and we're going to grow. We're going to become a movement. We're going to get traction. We're going to see some God do some great things in us and through us. Amen? Amen? And that's why we do Bible studies. That's why we're in the word, and that's why we become students of the word, because that's, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's word will not return empty. It will accomplish a purpose for which it is sent, right? And we grow in respect to our salvation. As we grow, we're going to multiply, we're going to get traction, and we're going to go forward. And that's what they were doing. They're teaching. And they're filling their Jerusalems with the teaching of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm excited about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel. Now, we, we got a radio station. We have our own Calvary Chapel radio station. If you're not listening to it, shame on you. No, just kidding. But there's great teaching on that. 107.9, whenever you're in Lexington, tune that in. And 24-7, you're going to have great teaching of biblical teaching. You know, we got a TV show. It's awesome. It's at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. When we first started, I thought, no one's going to watch this at 6.30. But you know what? Everywhere I turn, I go in our community. Last Sunday, my son John G. was visiting from Greenville. We went out to lunch together, and this lady came up to our table and just said, I watch you every Sunday morning. And I had no idea who she was. And she doesn't even go to our church. But we're getting outside the four walls of this church with the teaching of God's word, with radio, with TV. And we're, that's what we need to keep doing. We're going to be the movement God's called us to be, to fill our Jerusalems with the teaching of God's word. That makes a movement, and we're going to keep doing that. Now it goes on, verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey what? God rather than men. And the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death. Look, at he's giving the responsibility right back to these religious leaders. You put him to death, hanging him on a cross. And he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince. Prince could also be translated pioneer and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they heard this, they were what? Look at that. Cut to the quick, my version says. And notice, religious leaders, religious guys, they intended to kill him. Now, there's two responses to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The first response we saw in Acts 2. Remember when Peter was preaching on Pentecost? They were pierced to the heart. They were convicted. And what did they do? They repented. They got saved. They were baptized. And they responded to that cut to the heart, pierced to the heart, by turning to God. But there's another response that can come from conviction. You know what it is? Right here. Hatred. Anger. Taking people off. You know, and that's what's going on with these religious leaders now. They were cut to the heart, but they didn't repent. And uh, Peter's giving it to them. Peter's saying, he's giving them the whole gospel. He's saying, you guys hung him on the cross, Jesus, the prince and savior, and not only did you hang him on a cross, but the, you guys, 
He rose from the grave. And he's come to give forgiveness to your nation through repentance. But did they repent? No. Now, did this stop Peter and John because of the persecution that's coming on? No, they, they just kept on preaching. And they gave it to him. And they gave the gospel. Unapologetically, they preached to the Sanhedrin the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though they had told them, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. But their attitude is, we're not going to stop speaking this gospel that Jesus told us to preach. They had marching orders, remember? Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go, disciples, go. Preach the gospel to all creation. Go, Matthew 28. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. These are the marching orders. And they weren't going to stop marching. Here's the next thing that makes a movement. It's awesome. Be unstoppable. And not only be unstoppable, but listen, unapologetically, this is very important. Here's the second point. Unapologetically, unapologetically preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unapologetically. Now, does that mean you're supposed to be rude, obnoxious, weird? No. We got enough Christians like that out in the world, okay? Don't be weird, don't be obnoxious, don't be rude. But don't be ashamed of what saved you. Romans 1.16, Paul said this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's what? The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why in the world would we be ashamed of the thing that has forgiven us and given us salvation and given us heaven instead of hell? Why would we be, a, why would we be apologetic about that? Disciples weren't, we shouldn't be either. Amen? And we should be people, again, don't be weird, don't be obnoxious, don't be rude, but don't be ashamed either. Bring it. A world needs to hear the truth that can save them. It's 38 plus years ago, I had two guys in my life, Tom Riley and Bruce Barkley. Both these guys are highly respected, great athletes, great guys. But I had a problem. I was lost and they were saved. And they knew I had a problem. And they unapologetically shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me for months. They didn't back down. They didn't give up. They weren't ashamed of what they believed in. They brought it to me. And it took about six months, and I finally came to Christ. And I'm so glad they weren't timid with that gospel with me. Because it changed my life. And it's given me a life that couldn't have been better with it. I mean, I, I never once have been doubting that decision I made because they gave me the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the best decision I've ever made because they gave me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful to these guys that they weren't apologetic with the gospel of Jesus Christ in my life. Amen? So let's be some light, church. Let's this next year, let's make it a goal to bring some light to some dark places in our spheres of influence. Let's get out of being timid Christians and let's be bold. Part of what we're reading in Acts as we go through the book of Acts is they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're bold in their witness for Jesus Christ. And so let's do some of that, amen? No more timid Christianity. No more camouflage Christians. <laughs> no more wallflower Christians. Let's be Christians that take a stand for Jesus Christ. And let your light shine in such a way that others may see your good works, and then they too may glorify your Father in heaven. Now, does that mean you're, you're going to be fine? No, you're going to get some heat for it. That's what they're getting right now. They're getting heat for it, but they're going to be unapologetic, and we need to be unapologetic too, and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it. Amen? So let's keep going now. It says, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, notice, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care of what you propose to do with these men. So Gamaliel, teacher of the law, he's part of the Sanhedrin. And what he's doing is he's saying, okay, all you apostles out, all you Sanhedrin in, let's talk about this thing here a second. And he said, take care of what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of 
Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished. And all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men. Let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it'll be overthrown. But if it's of God, you'll not be able to overthrow them or else you may be even found, what? Fighting against God. Now, Gamaliel, interesting character. We know from uh, Jewish history that he was called Rabban. Rabbi in that day was a disciple of men, a teacher. Rabban was a teacher of a nation. And so he had risen to this point of being a teacher of the law that the whole nation was looking to him. We know from Acts chapter 23 that he was actually the teacher of Saul of Tarsus who went on to become the Apostle Paul. And it's interesting, Josephus in his Jewish historical writings says that the one problem that Gamaliel had with this Saul of Tarsus was he couldn't provide enough books for him to read because Paul was so intent on reading everything he could possibly read. This Gamaliel, it says in Jewish history, it says when he died, it says because of his great teaching, the beauty and the glory of God's law ceased after he stopped teaching because he was such a great teacher of the law. And what is he saying to his Sanhedrin now? He's saying, guys, if this movement, if this, if this movement is something that's of God, you better be careful. If it's not of God, it'll cease. It'll die out. But if it's, if it's of God, and you try to stop this, you might be fighting against God. And that's good, wise counsel he's given them there. Do they listen to him? Look what happens. And they took his advice, not really, because after calling the apostles in, they what? They flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. Now look at the response of the disciples. Did it stop their movement? Did it stop them preaching the gospel? Did it stop them teaching? No, it says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they'd been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple, which is publicly, from house to house privately, they kept right on what? Teaching, I love this, and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now question, how do you stop guys like this? Answer, you don't. And that's the third thing I want you to see is a movement of Christians is only gonna be a movement if they're unstoppable. The Bible says, again, the Bible says, 2 Timothy, it says this, that all who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You can get some heat for living a godly life in an ungodly world, but if you wanna be a part of a movement and make a difference for God, you gotta be unstoppable. You gotta be like Paul that says, I have fought the good fight. I finished the course, I kept the faith. I'm gonna keep on. Paul says, I'm pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You gotta, it doesn't matter what life throws at you. It doesn't matter what persecution comes. It doesn't matter what heat you get for being godly in an ungodly world. You're gonna keep on keeping on with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love these guys. They get, it says flog. The word flog there in the Greek could be translated skinned. It's scourging. That's what they would do is they'd have a, a, a whip with 39 tails with glass and metal at the end of the tails and they got their backs skinned. And as they're going out, what are they saying? Woe is me, I can't believe they did this to me. No, what does it say they did? They rejoiced because they've been, uh, they've been counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of the one that died for them, Jesus Christ. They were like, praise the Lord, my back will heal. Praise the Lord, I get to suffer for the one that died for me. That's what they were doing. How do you stop guys like that? Again, answer, you don't. And that's the next thing. We gotta be in the same place because let, let me tell you something, church. This world is getting darker. Satan is pulling out all the stops because he knows his time is short. Persecution, even in the United States, is probably gonna get stronger against Christianity. You know, look what happened in this last election when when the liberals didn't get who they wanted president. And it's, it's, it's like, man, all kinds of stuff. You know, gaskets are blowing everywhere. And it's going to happen with Christianity in these last days. In these last days, there's going to be some heat for being a Christian. But you know what I say to that? Praise the Lord. 
because it's gonna test the validity of people's Christianity. It's way too easy to be a Christian in the United States today. As persecution comes, it's gonna purify the church. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord, but in the midst of that, church, please, we gotta be unstoppable. We gotta keep going forward. We gotta keep preaching the gospel. We gotta keep being witnesses. We gotta keep going forward with what God's called us to do because Satan wants to discourage, he wants to paralyze, he wants to stop the church. We gotta keep going forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, my life verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be immovable. Be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil in the Lord, it's not in vain. You know, this last couple of years, I've had some bumps in the road, some health issues and some other things, and I'll be honest with you, there's been times in this last couple of years where I felt like quitting, more than once. But whenever I, I got to that point of being discouraged and felt like quitting, you know what reverberated in my spiritual ears? John Hoppy, be steadfast. John Hoppy, be immovable. John Hoppy, always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toll in the Lord is not in vain. And John Hoppy, don't you dare quit. John Hoppy, be steadfast. And I would say, you know, amen. Amen. Let's keep going, Lord. And you know what? It's not easy being a Christian in a world that's opposed to Christianity, and it's getting more and more opposition but you know what? If the devil wants to give us a battle, let's give him a fight. Amen? Amen. Let's be unstoppable. Let's, let's unashamedly bring the light of Jesus Christ to this world, and let's keep going forward for the cause of Christ. I've probably read this before, but I'm going to read it again, because it's too good not to read it again. It's, it's, a, it's a quote from Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And this quote became famous because an African pastor in Zimbabwe had it on his desk and it was, it was found on his desk after he was martyred for the cause of Christ. Because he took a stand for Christ. Uh, warring tribes or whatever else didn't like his Christianity and they killed him. And they found this on his desk. It says, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision's been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, I lean into his presence, I walk by patience, I'm uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, hey, but my mission's clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifices, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I like this. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. <laughs> Woo. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach to all I, to all I know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me because recognizing me my banner's clear. I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. And can we say amen to that, church? Let's be a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. Let's be unstoppable. Let's unapologetically bring what we believe to a world that desperately needs to hear about the truth and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And we are gonna be a movement. And we're gonna see God do some incredible things in this next year. I'm excited. How about you? Amen. 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 Let's close up our scripture now this morning. Go to Acts chapter six, and it says, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. 
So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of the task, but we will devote ourselves to what? Prayer and what? Ministry of the word. There it is. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And notice what happens, verse 7, movement. And the word of God, what? Movement, kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to what? Increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient, even priests, to the obedience of the faith. Okay, here's the last principle. If we're going to be a movement like them, we need to see a multiplication of ministry where every member in the body of Christ gets it. Every member is a minister. Every one of you got gifts. And see, what's going on here with the New Testament church is, is they had widows, in that culture, there was no social security, there was no welfare program, and if your husband died and you didn't have a job, you were out in the streets and you were homeless. So what the church did is they took on the widows. They fed them. They loved them. They took care of them. But what was going on is these apostles, who were the pastors, started having all this responsibility of feeding the widows all the time. They were neglecting prayer and the ministry of the word. They said, we can't do this. We gotta stick to what God's called us to do as pastors, and that's prayer in the ministry. So they raised up six men. These were the first deacons in the New Testament church. And these six men were full of the spirit and full of wisdom, and they, were, they, they had this ability to be solid, strong leaders for these widows. And so they, they brought them on into the church and said, now we are gonna have you guys take care of the widows, but we as pastors are gonna devote ourselves to prayer in the ministry of the word. And because of that, the word of God kept spreading, disciples kept getting made, and the movement continued to go. But if they got bogged down as pastors and all they were doing was feeding and serving tables, they wouldn't have been able to keep increasing devotion to prayer and the ministry word, and the church could have stalled. Now, this is important because what I've learned here in the South, I've been here 20 years almost, this Easter will be 20 years. I've learned that many churches in the South, especially smaller churches, expect the pastor to do everything. Expect the pastor to do every hospital visit and every hospital visit of every relative of every member of the church. That pastor better be there. And if he's not there, we're gonna fire him. Or pastors needs to be at every committee meeting. Pastor has to be at every, you know, um, whatever. Pastor has to do this and 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 do this. And you know, what, what happens then is the pastors get away from devoting themselves to prayer. The ministry of the word, the churches stay small and they don't continue to grow. You know, again, it's good for pastors to go to hospitals. I was in the hospital this week. I was visiting a, a, a brother of a member of our church. He had a serious motorcycle accident. I went and prayed for him, read scripture to him. It, you know, I'm going after this service, after lunch, I'm going to visit a gentleman who used to come to our church that has heart problems to the point that he f- feels in the next couple weeks he's going to die. He wants me to come and pray with him, and I'm going to share the gospel, make sure he's right with God. I do those things, but my primary ministry and focus is prayer and ministering the word of God to you all. And, and, and what we've seen here at this church, which is awesome, is other people have risen up within our church to do some of these other things. We not only have a staff, we have a care ministry. I don't know if you knew this or not, but we have a care ministry, about 15 people that make it their ministry to go to hospital visits and pray for people and take care of people. And that's taken some of the load off my shoulders and we've multiplied the ministry and it's a great ministry. Now, Scott Harrison runs that ministry and he communicates with everybody and he gets this thing going. There's a multiplication of ministry going on there. That's the way it's supposed to be, amen? And the pastor's job, according to Ephesians chapter four, and right around 10 to 13, is to be a pastor teacher that equips the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. So my job is to teach you all the word and equip you with God's word so you can find your gifts, get spiritually healthy, and the multiplication of ministry happens, and then every member becomes a minister instead of just the pastor. Amen? And that's what the church, when the church starts really going forward, 
people in the church are going to get this vision. I'm supposed to serve Christ. I'm supposed to use my gifts for the furtherance of the gospel. And I'm supposed to minister and not just rely on staff to do that. And that's when a church gets exciting. When everybody gets a calling and a gifting and, and they see their gifts being used for the glory and the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Amen? So what did we learn this morning about a movement? Number one, God's word. God's word's got to stay central in our church. The teaching of God's word. We're going to keep on keeping on just teaching God's word because God's word is what's going to build our church to be a movement for the cause of Christ. God's word. The teaching of God's word. Number two, we've learned the importance of unapologetically sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the people. And I'm excited about this because our next series for small groups, our next six-week series starting in January, we're going to do a six-week series by Greg Laurie, probably one of the greatest evangelists in the world today, I believe. He's got a six-week DVD series we're going to do. It's called Tell Someone. And it's going to train us as a church to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. It's going to be a lot of fun. You, I think every single, single person in the room should jump in a small group and get equipped in evangelism through this six-week series. It's going to be coming into January. Unapologetically preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be doing. Number three, unstoppable. Just because you get a little heat, don't let that stop you. Actually, enjoy that. It might mean it's because you're make, making a stand for Jesus Christ, you're getting some flack. All who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Invite that. These early disciples, they rejoiced when they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. Number four, hey, multiplication of ministry. Every member's a minister. We all got gifts. Let's get busy serving our, our Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, God, that your word equips us in righteousness. Thank you that your word strengthens us, Lord. Thank you that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, God. Thank you, God, that the calling you have for us as a church is to be a movement, God. A church that's going forward with your gospel, and with your kingdom, and with your truth, with your grace, and with your love, with your word, with your teaching, Lord. And I pray that you help us to continue to do that, Lord. Help us all of us, Lord, to press on to the upward call that you have for each one of our lives, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you have a future and you have a hope for each one of us, Lord. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to be applying these principles we learned this morning. Help us to be people that are all about your word, God. Help us to be people that are just growing in the grace and knowledge of your word, God. Help that to be our spiritual food and help us to, even this Bible reading program we're starting in this next year, help us to get on board, Lord, to just be people of your word, Lord. Help us to be people, too, that are unapologetic with your gospel, Lord. Not ashamed of your gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Lord, help us to take some stances with people that are in our spheres of influence that need, need the truth that saved us. Father, I pray for when trials hit or persecution hits or, or attacks or whatever, Father, help us to be unstoppable. Help us to be like these early disciples that said, we're not going to stop. Whether we obey you rather than God, you be the judge, but we're going to keep speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. That's our calling, Lord, to be fishers of men. Help us to keep fishing, Lord. And Father, I pray too for this last area of gifting and and Father, just thank you, Lord, that you've called each one of us, Lord, to use our gifts to serve you, Father. Show us some ways we could greater serve you, Father, and minister in your name. As we have a new year coming, Lord, help us to make it a goal that we're going we're gonna to get involved and serve your, your kingdom and be involved in your church in such a way we can make a difference, God. Work that out in our hearts, Father. Thank you again, again Father, for this time of year. It's a great time. And may this holiday season coming up this week, Lord, may it be a time, may it be a time of just basking in your love, in your grace, in your son Jesus. Help us to have just some great holidays with family and loved ones, Lord. And may Jesus be the reason for the season. And may his presence and his peace and his joy and his love be in our homes and our hearts. And as people enter our homes, family members and friends, and may they just sense your presence, Lord, your glory, your love. 
in our hearts and our homes, Lord. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,